Here we go. Welcome to 91 Octane. Today we have a very special guest, Ross Bentley, a renowned race car driver, coach, podcaster, and author. Ross has had a successful career in racing, including victories in the U.S. Road Racing Championship and the 24 Hours of Daytona. He has also, uh, he has also coached some of the world's top drivers, including multiple champions. In addition, Ross has written several best-selling books on the art and science of driving under the Speed Secrets brand. In this episode, we will discuss his career, coaching philosophy, and insights in the world of high-performance driving. Let's start the show. This thing is a freaking monster. <laughs> All right, welcome again, Ross Bentley. Thank you for joining me on the show. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm a little worried. You you mentioned special guest, and I'm like looking around, going, "Well, where is this special <laughs> guest person that you're talking about?" So uh, that's uh, your, your your imposter syndrome is talking right now. It's showing a little bit, but <laughs> but you are yeah. very you are very much someone we all look up to. You've gotten me through some difficult times, believe it or not. And, and you know, in terms of my career. I haven't hit road racing yet. I'm still a time trials guy, but you know we do a lot of stuff on the track, and sometimes you know we'll we'll spin out, we'll go four off, we'll lose a bumper, and it's like where do we go from here? Um, and you know there's a lot of things that uh, you know that we'll touch on that you speak about in your book that have really helped me through that, and I wanted to make sure we brought that to 91 Octane. So thank you for joining me. Um, and and really, I want to start with your career and, and racing to kick us off. And and every once in a while, I'll do some light reading. And I stumbled upon a sentence that blew my mind. It stated that you started driving at the age of four. But it doesn't go into detail beyond that. Is that true? And what were you driving? Uh, no, that was not true. I don't know where, where that sentence was. But uh, I actually went to my first race uh, when I was like, five, four, somewhere in that range. Uh, my dad took me to my first race where I watched uh, oval track racing. And that's kind of what my dad was into. Um, he didn't he didn't drive, but he built race cars. And so I kind of grew up at the racetrack. Uh, like I said, uh, oval racing, uh, super modified, sprint cars, all that kind of stuff. And uh, so, yeah, it was uh, pretty much from the time I was five, well, to, to, to today, it seems like every, <laughs> every weekend I'm at a racetrack somewhere of some yeah. type. Yeah, and so, and where I got this piece of information, and this is why you can't trust Wikipedia, is Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't even know there was anything on there, but we, anyways, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah so it, it went, so that was your first uh, event. Did you sort of catch the bug when you were four and five, uh, or yeah. did that take a little, oh, you did immediately. I mean, that night, I mean, I came home that night and, and like a lot of kids, you know, you tell, uh, you tell your parents what you're going to be, you know, you're going to be an astronaut, you're going to be a firefighter, you're going to be a doctor, you know, you're whatever it is. Right. That night I told my parents, I'm going to be a race car driver. And pretty much, you know, every, every day from that moment on, um, that's all I ever thought about. There was a period of time in my teens where I played tennis very seriously. Okay. And thought maybe I could make it as a pro tennis player, but uh, and I, I tell this story that, that kind of silly, ironic, uh, stupid, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, I actually quit playing tennis and went racing because I couldn't afford to play tennis. So, so what I decided <laughs> to do: go racing, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I, I always wanted to go racing. That was certainly my goal, but there was a period of time there playing tennis where I was doing well and, you know, sort of uh, playing on these turn tours and all this kind of stuff and kind of like, well, maybe this would work, you know, this would be a good career. But um, yeah, I couldn't, I, I, I was up against, I was up against other kids um, who were from families that could afford where the kid was all he did was play tennis all day they had the best coaches all that kind of stuff and I didn't I'd play and practice as much as I could and then go and work a job and come back and do that and eventually just went I can't keep up with those guys that have got that so I'm gonna do what I really want to do which is go racing and 
you know, you, you find a way then. Uh, yeah, no, so, you definitely yeah. found a way. I mean, from where you're at now, uh, yeah, racing is um, an exercise in nothing but expense. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. What was your first car now that you've decided to move away from tennis and now you're going back into racing? What car are you taking? What does your program look like? Well, the very first race was actually in a super modified. So I first started in a, in a super modified and, okay. and it was the car that my dad was pre preparing for another driver who owned the car. And ironically, it was a driver that I had watched crash at that very first race when I was five years old. And I remember his name, but, uh, uh, I had gone to the Jim Russell racing school in California in, at Willow Springs and come back and this driver had just been diagnosed with a very serious illness. Uh, the doctor said, you can't race anymore. So he turned to me and he said, well, you went to a racing school, you drive this thing. So off we went to um, a race in Quinnell, British Columbia, my home province in Canada. And uh, I, I was up against guys who I had grown up watching as a kid. And against guys like, uh, well, Tom Sneva, who's won the Indy 500, his brothers, uh, guys like that. So, you know, really top super modified guys in the Pacific Northwest. And somehow first race, I ended up winning it. And it was kind of one of those, um, if there, if I, I guess I, I had always gone into racing going, if I'm good enough, I'm going to continue. But if I'm not, I'm not going to. Like, I'm not going to, I'd grown up watching some drivers who, you know, even, even as a, whatever, an eight year old, a 12 year old, I could look at them and go, nah, that guy is just not like the rest. You know, he's not good enough. He's not yeah. special. He doesn't and have it. Yeah. So I, I always thought, I don't want to be one of them. I want to be somebody who can, who can race. You don't have to win every race. The thing about racing is, you know, typically there are whatever. What, well, there's one winner and there's whatever, 24 losers, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't want to be a consistent loser. I wanted to be able to win some races. And right. so I won that first race. And I guess that pretty much uh, set the course for the rest of my life. Uh, now, you say somehow, but you don't just somehow win, right? So what were some of the things that you did at that time to kind of put yourself in a position to win? Well, I think one of the things is, and it's, you know, to this day, one or throughout my career, really, I was, a, I wasn't always the fastest guy. I would, you know, but I was a really good racer. And there's a difference between driving fast and being a good racer, knowing racecraft. And, and I believe it was because from the time I was five, I was sitting in a grandstand, looking down at a short oval track and watching the way drivers would strategize passing and I think that experience of I, I, by the time I was 10 I could look at a field of super modified or sprint cars and go watch that car right there watch the way that driver gets through traffic and I just saw so many passes because one of the great things about short track oval racing is there's a lot of passing cars are in traffic all the time and you could just see the way the best drivers would set up a pass and work a pass and everything. And even though road racing um, is different, the the strategy that goes into racecraft is is the same. Racecraft is racecraft. Right. So I think that, you know, for part part of it for me was uh, I, I just had ever since I was a little kid, all I'd done was watched and studied and I, I I guess I watched racing for more than just the entertainment value. I looked right. at it as I'm here to get an education and I got a lot of education watching these really, really, really good drivers. Some of them that did, you know, go to Indy and stuff. So, uh, I'd say that was the, that was the biggest difference was, I guess I was, I was pretty well prepared mentally and having that mental model of what it takes to win. Right. No, that's huge. I mean, to, to have studied since five, um, that'll definitely have an impact. And you went on to win double-digit racing championships as an amateur. 
um, and then went to went on to win many more as a professional. Um, what is your most memorable victory now? Now that you know you've gone through a huge portion of your career. Well, I'd like to answer it the way the way I I, I answer a lot of questions. The next one, <laughs> that that's the most memorable. One. <laughs> yeah. So if if I race again, then uh, that would be the most memorable. Uh, I I guess. Um, Certainly, some of the race wins I had uh, when I was racing Formula Ford, my first two seasons of road racing in a Formula Ford, partially because Formula Ford racing is so competitive and it is so crazy. Uh, Crazy in uh, what sense? Crazy in, there are times when I watch a a really good Formula Ford race and it's a little bit like watching a, you know, an MX-5 race now. You, you just look at those guys and you go, man, those guys are crazy. Right. Well, that's what I was doing, and it's what I would do again today if I could, if I was in one of those cars. So it just, you know, it's it's super competitive. The passing back and forth, it's just really, really competitive. And I, I, I'd say it's still some of the most fun racing I've ever done in my life. So I can't think of a specific race, uh, maybe the very first Formula Ford race win, but. Um, the other one would be Daytona 24. Uh, we, it was a race we probably should not have won. We were in a car that should not have won, but what was wrong? Think, was there something wrong with the car? Was it just not optimized? Uh, so it was a weird deal. I, I, whatever year that was, uh, the the series changed the rules and mandated a spec rear wing for all the cars and I was driving a Lola car with a Nissan engine and when we put the rear wing on the car uh, we went testing and I remember driving it the first time and going this thing is deadly like it is so unstable and we tested a little bit more and then we got a we got a message from Lola saying uh, we've just been running that uh, in a in a wind tunnel do not take the car on track it's dangerous and we had just been testing, but, and we're in this position where we've entered, we're gonna run the Daytona 24 hour race. Uh, we're in this car that's, uh, should have been better. If we'd had the, the, the rear wing that the car was designed for, it would have been fantastic. We probably would have driven away from everybody, but it was, uh, it just made the car very unstable. And, you know, at Daytona, when you're up on the high banks, generally that's a, you know, drive with one hand and, it's, it's it's kind of like driving in the straightaway. But in this thing, it was literally both hands on the wheel, trying to control the car and making sure the rear of the car doesn't come around on you. And and it got worse if there were other cars around you as well. So the car was extremely unstable. Somebody described it as it was kind of like an arrow with the, the feathers pointing the wrong way. It just made the car very unstable. So in practice, we were like three or four seconds off the pace and we kept tuning and trying to make it better and for qualifying i went out and thought okay i need one one good lap and i just got a bit dumb (laughs) and 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 went for it and qualified like four tenths off a pole and but like over three seconds faster than we'd ever gone before but I remember doing one lap, coming in the pits and said, that's it, guys. I can't do that again. Like, I'm not risking that again. Wow. And okay. So that's the way we started the race. And we just took the attitude of all we're going to do is put pressure on the other cars, the other drivers, the other teams, and keep pressuring and keep close enough that we're going to force them into making mistakes. Because 24-hour races are, one way to look at a 24-hour race is it's, the team that manages the mistakes or the problems the best because in 24 hours everybody's going to have a problem everybody's going to have you know a mistake the best teams recover from them and make up for them the best way so we decided that our best chance was just not make any mistakes and stay close enough to put pressure on everybody else And I remember the first couple of stints I drove at the start of the race, um, just staying close enough to the other teams that you could see they were like, 
they were worried that we were coming because because of the team that I was driving for and who was in the car co-driving with me and things, people kind of went, wow, they should be fast. They're going to be tough to beat. But if they only knew what we were struggling with, um, they wouldn't have said that. So we kept pushing and pushing and they kept making mistakes. And, and it came down to an hour and a half to go. We were actually in the lead by, by a lap. And okay. so at 23 and a half or 22 and a half hours, we were there. And we also had a team car, except another car that was also running, exact same car, same issues. They were behind us a little ways, um, but they had a problem where the wiring to the brake lights broke and they oh. got black flagged. Oh no. Uh, half an hour later, uh, I get a call on the radio saying our brake lights have just failed. And myself and the team manager, we were so in sync that like within a lap, uh, I, I remember, uh, so within a lap, I looked over at the dash and saw the switch for the rain light. And like, as I'm thinking, could I just turn the rain, rain light on and off every time I braked? Oh my God, Ross. <laughs> and at that same time, the team manager said, came on the radio and said, there won't be any rain before the end of the race, which was kind of like the code, like he was trying to give me a hint. Right. And, and so he and I thought that at the exact same time. So for the last hour and a half, I drove the race, turning the rain light on every time I applied oh the brakes. My God. So I'd come into turn one, get on the brakes, re reach over, flick on the rain light, get, turn into the corner, reach over, turn the rain, rain light off. Wow. And every now and then, it, and, you know, they had just like when I got the radio call originally, the team manager said, you know, officials are watching us kind of like we're going to get black flagged. And I started doing this and he came on the radio and said, all's good, keep going. And every now and then, you know, just in a pack of cars and you're coming into a, into a break zone and it was like, I'm, I was too busy, right? And, you know, and, and I just couldn't do it. Um, but it was so random and so few times, I guess, that the officials never got it. So we drove the last hour and a half of the race and won because we just outsmarted everybody. And I'm not saying I was smart, but it was just, I, we did a better job of managing our problems than they did. And we ended up winning that race. So it was very satisfying because, you know, there was a moment where I, where we were quick and we were quick enough, but we just uh, kind of outsmarted everybody else. That was that's very satisfying. Incredible. That it, that's, <laughs> <laughs> to be flicking a switch in the middle of a race, like to hit your brakes, that's, I mean, that's one thing. And I, and I, I want to put it into perspective, right? You have an hour and a half left on the race and you're up by one lap. What does that mean, you know, at, at that level? Like how hard is it to recover that lap in a last hour and a half? It, it, it all depends on the yellow flags. Oh, uh, you're right, yeah. Because if the yellow had, it, you know, if we had backed off a little bit, somebody had gotten, you know, just in front of us, a yellow come out, they'd get their their their, flat, or their lap back. Or, you know, just sometimes you can get caught up by uh, just the way the traffic works and everything. So sometimes it's easy to get a lap back because of the way the yellow flags work. Sometimes it's difficult. And... You know, we had only gotten that big of a lead, which was a pretty big lead. Uh, well, of, you know, it's it's a big it's a big lead, but even at the end of 24 hours, it's it's still a pretty big lead. So uh, we'd gotten that because, again, the other teams had just um, they'd had a few more problems than we did. Right. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't the fact that you were flipping a switch and, you know, we're using the rain light as a brake light while you were finishing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is so amazing to me that you knew you would consider that. I mean, I feel like a lot of people, I mean, at that level, you're going to do anything you can to finish the race. But I, I feel like to to have the know-how immediately to think, okay, this is what I'm going to do and struggle through it with a difficult car on top of that. Um, that's amazing. I, I would almost, I probably would have called this out as my most memorable victory. I'm surprised <laughs> you didn't touch on this one. But yeah. well, uh, you mentioned earlier that, you know, even as a young kid, uh, you sort of could tell who were going to be the leaders of the pack, who really didn't have it. 
um, in your experience now, what what truly separates like exceptional drivers from the rest of the pack? What are what are some common characteristics and traits that you see in these drivers? Uh, for sure, the 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 single thing that separates the best from the rest, I believe, is it's the desire. It's the uh, I'll do whatever it takes. And that's not necessarily just on the track. And it's not necessarily in a, you know, I'm going to push you off the track to win. But uh, the the best drivers work at their craft, at their profession, more and better than the others. And, you know, I, I, you know, I can't say what it was like in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but, you know, there's stories of, drivers who would be partying all night and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that kind of stuff just doesn't work anymore. Right. And it hasn't for a long time. And the very, very best drivers have the discipline. They're willing to sacrifice everything in their lives to do what the, it takes to win. And, you know, so, so now you look at it and you go, okay, well, everybody's in that, you know, to even be on the grid nowadays for a top level pro race, you have to have had that. You know, it, 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 here's an example of that. Um, people look at Lance Stroll in Formula One, you know, son of a gazillionaire, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and, and they look at him and go, oh, well, he's only there because daddy's paid for it all. Yeah. Right. And, and yet Lance Stroll works at it as hard as anybody else. What impresses me the most about Lance Stroll is here's a guy that could have cruised through life, never having to lift a finger to do anything, and yet he does the opposite of that. He works his butt off. I mean, you know, just before the start of the the F1 re season, you know, he crashes on a on a on his bicycle while training, breaks whatever it is in his body, and you know, is back in the car. Whoop, before anybody else would have been in a lot of pain. Uh, you know, that's not a, that's not what some people think of as a rich kid. So I think that's the biggest thing is just, you, you can see, and sometimes you can watch a driver on the track where one driver is, you can almost see it in them, their, the way they drive and they're kind of, it's almost like they're, well, second place is good enough. Whereas somebody else will go, no, uh, I'm going to, you know, I, I, I'm going to find a way. And uh, often, you know, the the few weekends that I'm at home when I get a chance to watch uh, an IndyCar race or a Formula One race or sports car race, I'm usually at those, or a NASCAR race or whatever it is, um, uh, you know, my wife and I will sit down to watch an IndyCar race. And Scott Dixon, uh, I, rem I remember a couple of years ago, uh, Road America on the first lap of the race, he got pushed off the track or hit by somebody and in turn five on the very first lap. And now he's in 28th place. And I turned to my wife and I said, watch Dixon. He'll be on the podium. Guess what? He was on the podium. Um, wow. Whereas, you know, some drivers at that point would have gone, well, let's see what we can salvage out of this. No, Dixon's like, no, I'm going to the front. And, Yes, um, sometimes you get lucky. Uh, yeah. Scott Dixon uh, seems to find a way to get lucky a lot. And I think it's just because he worked so hard. Another great example of Scott Dixon was a few years ago when he had that big, big crash at the Indy 500. And uh, he was, um, uh, it was one of those ones where he got caught up in somebody else's crash, hit the car, launched him in the air. The car landed upside down. He slammed in the inside retaining wall there was a fire as the oil tank or oil lines broke you know and you looked and you went oh that's not good you kind of get that feeling like well he gets out of the car and limps away um that's on you know indy 500 on a sunday monday morning at 7 a.m he's in the gym working out yeah and how many how many other drivers i mean i'll bet there are drivers who didn't win indy 500 it um Maybe he finished thirty third at the in the in the race, and they went Monday. I'll just take the day off. 
Scott Dixon was back in the gym working out the day after the Indy 500, after he had crashed. Um, so th- it, it, that's, the, that's the single biggest difference. And, and again, there are times if you watch enough racing where you can just watch drivers and you go, that driver wants it really bad. And they will find a way more often than dr- other drivers will. Right. I mean, it's it's sort of, uh, uh, I know that luck has in a play, but unless you are sort of ready and prepared for that opportunity, those two have to converge, right? The luck yes. and the preparation have to converge. So Absolutely. that's that's where they catch those. So that that's interesting. So um, I guess this is a really hard question to ask, and it's an unfair question, I think. But can anyone be a race car driver, in your opinion? If yes. they have this, if they have this piece, yes. Okay. Uh, so, so anybody can be a race car driver. Not, not anybody can be a world champion or an Indy five hundred winner. Right. But, but one of the things I think is fantastic about our sport, and you know, whether it's racing or HPDE or autocross or time trials or you know oval track racing road racing drag racing off-road rally you name it there's a place that anybody can participate you know in professional racing amateurs race in professional racing and sports car racing yeah. you know so the, there's a way there and you know i played like i said I, I i played tennis and to this day there is no way that i could go and play at center court at wimbledon <clears throat> I'm not allowed to. If, <laughs> if you know, if you're a football fan, pick your favorite football team. Can you go and play in their stadium? Probably not. But guess what? Anybody can go and drive at Coda, the same track that Lewis Hamilton wins on so often, a Formula One track. Anybody can go to Watkins Glen, or anybody can go and drive at Laguna Seca. I mean, our, our sport is so accessible, which is fantastic, and and so. Anybody can work their way up into racing. Some of it comes back to uh, how much are you willing to to sacrifice? How much are you? How much? How much effort are you willing to put into it? I, I've worked with a lot of drivers who say they want to be the best and they want to be champions, but aren't willing to do what it takes. I currently work with a gentleman driver in in IMSA sports car racing he's a 50-ish year old guy who five years ago didn't couldn't spell race car uh like he'd, <laughs> he'd never been to a race before five years ago a little over five years ago four and a half years ago was the first time he ever drove on a racetrack now he's racing in imsa and is one of the best gentleman drivers in the world and the biggest reason why he's gone so far in four and a half years is because he's willing to put in the effort to do it. He's the kind of guy that uh, I say, you know, we're going to, you know, I want you to practice this. I want you to do this. And we do stuff on the simulator. And, and, and you know, he, I'll say, okay, go and spend four hours on the simulator doing this. And I'll get a, a text or a phone call after that saying, okay, I did that. Now what do you want me to do? And <laughs> so, you know, he, he's, he works at it harder than anybody else. And, that's why he's progressed so far in such a little time. I want I want you to tell this story about me in five years. That that okay. awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that is awesome. That is. I mean, I think that is is uh, you have made it more realistic than more people think by just the, the first two things you said. One, I mean, you can't go play in Wimbledon, but you can go race in Laguna Seca. I I I've never actually heard it put in those terms, but. That is so so true, and it, it, it's 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 such a closer connection to our sport, and, and it gives us, it actually allows us to progress a lot faster because we're working the same tools that the pros are working, um, and, and and that's awesome. And to hear that a five year journey for someone who's you know who's turned fifty, when it's easy to say in any sport, right, that you're if you're beyond you know your thirties, then it's kind of, you're kind of over the hill, you can't do it. Whereas in in race car driving, there is much more opportunity than that. Um, so that was, that, that piqued my interest for sure. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, to be realistic is my coaching, my driver, 
Is he going to be a Formula One world champion? No. He's beyond that time uh, right. when, when that would be possible. And he didn't grow up racing go-karts from the time he was five years old, right? So yeah. th- there are certain, you know, there are certain limitations, but there are fewer than, yeah. I mean, if you're a 50-year-old, really, really, really good 50-year-old basketball player, you're still not going to play in the NBA. Oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> we need to be realistic about what we're shooting for. But, yeah. I mean, I mean to, to hear, you know, you, you're doing well in, like, IMSA, which that's significant, right? It's still there are still maybe the maybe it's not Mount Everest, right? But there are still mountains that we can climb. It is sort of yeah. the point. And there are so many opportunities, you know, from uh, you know autocross and uh, you know there's there is track driving, performance driving on the track. There is that, and then you know without any sort of wheel to wheel or competitiveness to that and then there's the competitive side which autocross is competitive time trials um you know the it used to be that to get into amateur racing you know it was still it was it was a challenge because you had to go through an scca licensing school and there was a lot of steps you had to go through and then these series like like lemons and uh, Champ Car and AER and WRL and all these ones came along where, you know, if you're, you, you, you don't need a lot. Uh, yeah. so, sometimes maybe maybe there could be a little bit more. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I have some questions about some of them, but uh, it, it's just opened it up so that, hey, if you want to go and race wheel to wheel or, you know, if you're in a competitive situation, there is a place that you can do it. And that's, like I said, it's so accessible. Yeah, no, it definitely is. It, it absolutely is. And it's really sort of our, our, our mission as 91 Octane to, to illustrate that. So I'm glad, you know, you're, we're hearing it from the man himself. Now, through this journey, um, you know, your, your automotive journey, at some point you decided, I'm, I'm going to start writing books about the stuff that I've learned. And, and there's, the first speed secret book, which I've read a mul- multiple times, um, what what sort of motivated you to to write that? What, at what point do you remember the moment that you decided I'm going to write a book about what I know? Uh, no, because I never really decided I was going to write a book. <laughs> it was it, I kind of stumbled into it in that. Uh, so I had started a high performance and race driving school partially because you know the life of a professional race driver is difficult you kind of need something else on the side at some point in time to pay the bills and i had learned early on that i really enjoy teaching the driving part or sharing what i've learned with other people so i'd started this uh high performance and racing driving school and you know one of the things that people expect is some information so i kind of write this you know at beginning it was like three pages of here's an apex of a corner kind of thing uh and then i kept sort of updating it and adding more to it and more and more and more and then it was sort of just after that where i'd gotten to the point where i was started to well i'd gotten some i gotten into indy cars and you know as i was traveling and as i was going to these races on the way there and on the way home I started just making notes for myself and it was kind of like, oh, I learned this this weekend and this is what I experienced. And by writing out what I had experienced, it sunk in and became, it was part of, it was the way I learned things. So I kept feeding this into this other document and pretty soon this, I ended up with this big, huge document. And one day I'm at a, at a track and I'm talking to a journalist, a really super experienced and knowledgeable racing journalist. And somehow we got into conversation. I said, yeah, I've been putting this thing in a big document. And he says, oh, hey, let me take a look at it. So I gave it to him and he says, this is the book. Uh, <laughs> and you need to contact this publisher and here's their contact, um, send it to him which I did. And they came back and said, we want to publish this. 
So wow. that's how the very first Speed Secrets book ended up being a book. Uh, like I said, I never intended to write a book. It, when when he said it's a book, I'm kind of like, yeah, right. And then when the publisher said we want to publish, I'm like, what? Something I wrote? You want to publish it? Like, I was the guy in high school that probably got voted as the 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 person least likely to ever write anything. <laughs> and, and so, but you know, the second that you write a book and it's being published, it's you know, a second later you go, yeah, but this is what it's missing, and. So myself and another guy wrote sort of the inner speed secrets, the mental game together. And then I wrote another one. And as I was traveling, I'd just get on airplanes and I'd start writing away. And it's, um, and at the same time, as I was sort of, as I was racing Indy cars, the major newspaper in Vancouver, my hometown, um, somehow I forget how, but I'd also been doing like in this driver training stuff, a lot of stuff around safe driving and working with police departments and people like that teaching driving skills. And the newspaper asked me to write a column every week on safe driving for the public reading a newspaper. And so for every week, for almost five years, I wrote a column. And if anybody ever wants to learn how to be a writer, have a deadline of you have to write something every single week and it's going to be published in a newspaper because it forces you to yeah. practice a lot. Fortunately, my wife uh, was and is a good editor. And, you know, in the beginning, I'd give it, so I'd give her something and she'd go and I'd go turn this into English and she'd <laughs> come back with red marks everywhere. And, and then through the years, you know, it'd come back with less and less and less to the point where it's like, I changed three words. And so obviously I was getting better at writing and I realized that I really enjoyed it because it was very, you know, there's a creative side to it, which I've always, always needed an outlet for being creative. So, um, yeah, that's how the books happen. They kind of just, you know, once you write one, you realize what you missed it, missed in it. So you want to write another one and then you want to write another one. And, um, fortunately the publishers were happy to keep publishing them. So, um, yeah. That's, and and that's how many happened. books are you at now? Have you lost count? Well, uh, if you include the, I wrote the, the Bob Bondurant on karting, go-karting, kart racing. Okay. I wrote that book. Um, supposedly with Bob and me writing it together, but it was just me writing it and Bob saying, <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and I then myself, yeah. And, and then myself, uh, and a fellow in Australia, who's a pilot for a major Australian airline. You can guess which one, uh, he, who he raced, he contacted me. We started talking back and forth about similarities between flying and racing. And eventually he and I wrote a book on, on for pilots called performance pilot. And it's oh, aim. Wow. It's kind of like the mental game of racing adapted to being a good pilot, whether you're flying for a airline or you're getting your first private pilot's license or whatever in between. So, um, so I think in total, I think that's, I think that's 11 books, I think. Wow. I think. No, you're, yeah. you're, I mean, you're a writer for sure. I mean, you may not start that way, but you're a writer now. <laughs> and I mean, and, and your writing has influenced me. I mean, every, every track day I'm waving my thumb around my, uh, I'm around ah, my cool. eyes, okay. you know, Great. like I, I'm doing my visualization exercises, but a big component, you know, a big piece in, in a lot of your books is the mental, mental aspects of driving. Um, so how important do you think mindset is to achieving success on the track? Are, are there sp specific skills that you need to develop? Uh, you know, how, how complex does it get? Uh, well, how complex? Uh, uh, I don't, I can't answer the question of how complex other than like a side of me wants to say it's very complex. And the other side of me goes, no, it's actually really, really simple. And, <laughs> and I think uh, like anything, the more complex it is, the more interesting it is to simplify it. And so the mental game part of it started for me with, I never had any money and I was always racing. What always seemed like I was in a car that was, uh, 
uh, underfunded. Um, (laughs) I probably, you know, I was maybe a little bit too optimistic in terms of, I'm going to go and race in that. Well, you got the budget to race a level or two below that, that you found with some, you put together some sponsors and you've got a budget to do something a level or two below that. I would go and do the level or two above that, even though the budget was a third of what it should be. I was always racing in sort of most of my career in in underfunded cars. So I was always looking for my advantage. And, uh, you know, even going kind of going back to my days of tennis, while while I couldn't I couldn't practice with a coach as much as somebody else could, I kind of just thought, well, I can think about it and I can do visualization and I can have the right mindset. And I, so I started, I guess, very early on, I started reading stuff around sports, sports psychology and sort of understanding the, the mental game of sport and then started to apply that and to myself and realized there's an advantage there. Um, and then as a coach, it's, you know, almost anybody can say, break here, turn in here, apex here. That's sort of the mechanics of driving. Right. It, it's a completely different thing for me. Let's say we're at the track and you're saying, and I'm saying you need to break here. And you're going, uh, I'm trying to, but my foot want, keeps coming off the gas pedal and, <laughs> or in not going to the, and going to the brake pedal too early. And, you know, that's not a, you don't have this. It's not like you're lacking a physical skill to be able to keep your foot on the gas pedal longer. Right. It's your brain saying no. You know, so there's that whole self-preservation piece around there. You know, our state of mind. You know, are you confident? Are you scared? Are you nervous? Are you relaxed? Are You know, all of those things. Uh uh, and your confidence or your belief system is probably the most powerful part of the whole puzzle. But all of those pieces, I mean, and I mean, I have this whole mental model I call a performance model. And yeah, it was going to, it would take like another four hours of the podcast. No, I mean, <laughs> but it would take too long to go through here, but all the details, but you know, there's everything from, if you take better quality sensory information in through your eyes, through your butt, through your hands, through your body, you know, all of that. And through your hearing, if you take in better quality sensory information, you can get a better quality output with your hands and feet doing the right stuff. You know, if, if you, if, you know, some of that sensory information is restricted for whatever reason, you're not sitting properly in your car, you're not looking far enough ahead. Uh, you, you know, you, 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 you're wearing a different helmet with different ear protection and it's changed the way you hear things. There's a learning process there. So uh, that's, that's been changed a little bit, but even if like, if, if you're in a really, really good mental state, you tend to see things better. You tend to feel things better. You tend to hear things better. So your mental state, your emotions, all of that, impacts how you take information in and all of those pieces are all interconnected and then if you're seeing things better than what you did before and you're just feeling better you're going to feel a little more confident well when you're feeling more confident that's going to have an impact on how you perform as well and you the way you perform the skills and everything and then you know obviously you can practice skills Physically, you can just do things over and over and over again, uh, like hitting a tennis ball. You swing it, you know, a thousand times, you get better at swinging that tennis racket. Well, the same thing with the way you apply the brakes, the way you release the brakes, the way you turn the steering wheel, the way you turn your head to look through a corner, the way you move your eyes to see where you're going. The more you practice those things, the better you're going to get at those. And you can practice them physically, but you can also practice them mentally by using visualization or mental imagery. So this whole big thing around the mental game, well, I I often ask the question, what percentage of performance driving or race driving is mental and what percentage of, is it it physical? And 
there obviously is no right or wrong answer to that. But generally, what if I ask people, uh, drivers, they'll say, oh, it's, you know, it's 80% mental, it's 60% mental, it's 99% mental, mental. And, and I'll kind of go, okay, but your body doesn't do anything unless your brain tells it to do so. So you could say it's 100% mental. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying it's taking anything away from the strength and endurance and all the other things that you're, you know, the better fit your body is, it's going to work better, but your brain's also going to work better because of it. So, you know, there's no sort of, there's no one single thing, but that whole mental game is, it's critical. It, it's, it's what makes the difference. You know, you asked the question of what makes the difference between the best and the rest. Uh, the, the physical skills that you and I have, and uh, we compare those to uh, Lewis Hamilton or Scott Dixon, we have the same physical skills, but their mental game is better than ours consistently. There may be times where you get on track and you be perf performing mentally at the same level as Hamilton or Dixon, but probably not as often. Otherwise, you would be making millions of dollars a year <laughs> driving race cars. <laughs> well, yeah. you guys heard it here. I'm basically Lewis Hamilton. So yeah, I just, yep. Ross just said it. Ross just said it. But I mean, well, I think it, what you go go ahead. Well, and just to to, to to jump off of that point is some people will ask drivers will ask me, what is it the best do? And I say they just do the basics better than everybody else. The advanced tricks you know, things that Lewis Hamilton does, it's just doing the basics better than anybody else. So you know how to do the basics. He just does the, those basics a little bit better than you do. Yeah. Well, again, I'm, a, I'm making a big assumption here. You yeah, may be no, just I, as no, good as him. I think you're safe on that assumption. <laughs> 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 but I think what you described, right, you, you, you sort of described the sort of this snowballing effect of, of you know, your, your, your mental preparation yields confidence, the confidence yields victories, and then that loop keeps going, and you yeah. get better, and your mental state gets better. Uh, but what what happens when there are setbacks or failures? Sometimes in some sports, is referred to as the yips, right? Where you sort of kind of lose that mental state. You you aren't able to come back to the same driver that you were. What are some of the some of the approaches you take with drivers when you see that type of behavior? Well, and again, this goes to your question of the difference between the best and the rest is the best get over those things quicker than the rest. And, uh, you know, everybody has sort of their own ways of dealing with that. As a coach, what, you know, one of the things, I mean, I've had drivers that'll, that'll say, you know, I just don't feel like I'm improving anymore. Or maybe I'm getting worse. And, you know, sometimes you, sometimes when we get into that mode, we try harder. And one of the things that, again, I've learned from watching a lot, and again, as a 10-year-old, I could probably sit in the grandstand of a sprint car race, and I could say that driver is trying too hard. And because you can just kind of see the way the car is moving. It's just like they're trying too hard. So sometimes when we get frustrated, we try harder. And as a coach, part of the job is to uh, help a driver loosen up a bit, let go, and, you know, especially if it's sort of started with maybe some mistakes, I always say that, you know, they're not mistakes, they're learning takes. They just, you just learn something from that mistake. Uh, and so that's the kind of the first step is to kind of just take that, that mindset of, uh, I'm focused on learning here. And that's my objective is to learn. So by every time I make a mistake, I've learned something. So that's the first step. And then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say, well, when you woke up this morning and you looked over at your pillow, did you happen to notice that all your talent and skill had dripped out of your head overnight <laughs> and it was now laying on your pillow? Uh, no, no. And, you know, obviously it's a kind of, it's a bit of a joke, but that's part of it is get the driver to kind of, yeah, I know all that's stupid. Like, it's not like, it's not like my talent or my skill has gone away. It's still in there. I just have to learn to access it more often and part of part of the job of a coach is yes it's to develop that talent that skill more but a big part of it is 
to help a driver access whatever talent and skill they have in their in their head inside their helmet uh, more often because again the difference between a Lewis Hamilton and many drivers is Lewis Hamilton doesn't have very many bad days yeah and and you know at the level that he and the top drivers are performing at a tenth of a percent worse performance is the difference between winning and 20th right most people go through life where eh, a bad day could be five percent off it could be 20 percent off uh not half a percent off or a tenth of a percent off but many percent off and the top level performers um are are just better at at be at that level more often. So again, big part of my job as a coach is first of all to help kind of frame the situation in a way that the driver goes, okay, I get it. You know, I get I'm trying to I gotta relax. I gotta focus on what my objectives are. It's learning. And by the way, why are you doing this? Oh yeah, to have some fun. Because especially, you know, I mean well, I, I was going to say especially pro drivers, but uh, I've worked with many amateur drivers, many, 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 who take it too seriously. They forget why they're doing it in the beginning, because I, I'm pretty. I I know for a fact that this sport, no matter what level and type of motorsport you're involved in, is it's hard to do. It's really difficult and it's the, there are easier things to do so if you're not having fun doing it stop <laughs> go you know that the bottom line is if you're not having fun if it's gotten to the point where this is no longer fun then just stop now it may be that by stopping you actually stop trying so hard you stop getting frustrated you kind of just go i'm just going to go and drive or i'm just going to go and race and that often kind of triggers a, a better level of performance. And then they start to see a little progress. Like you said, the snowball effect then. They see a little yeah. progress, confidence builds. Hey, I'm back, I'm back, you know. And, and that's no different than any athlete in any sport. If they've, if they've kind of, they're in a slump. Um, yeah. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's those are the, the main things. Uh, one of the things that I love about coaching is there are no two drivers in the world that are exactly the same. And uh, I, I work with drivers who a part of what I have to do is I have to figure out how to crack them. You know, I have to figure out what works for them because what works for one driver may not work for another driver. So yeah. it's that's that's the fun part. One of the many fun parts of coaching is is figuring out a way to get in. But the relationship of coach and driver has other variables too, right? And and I don't I don't you know there's you can have your your engineer can be your best friend and your worst enemy, right? Um, how do you balance sort of coaching and sort of the technical aspect of it? Like, say a driver comes to you and says. Well, I'm not driving well because the car is bad, but there's there's a there's a piece of you that says, okay, well, the car is actually fine, but some of it might be you, right? What what's your approach to balancing those two different things? Uh, that's a great question, and it's <clears throat> again, it's it's different for every situation, and every driver. You, you know, sometimes I have, you know, if I'm working with a driver that's in a a team that has a engineer uh, there are times when I've gone to the engineer and said okay I know the setup that you have on the car right now is faster than the setup we had before but this setup is also it's more knife edge it's less forgiving and right now the driver is lacking confidence so my recommendation would be Go back towards the setup you had before that was more comfortable and maybe a little bit slower, like ultimately in lap time, it may be a touch slower, yeah. but 
we need to rebuild the driver's confidence. And, you know, I've had, I've had engineers that say, look at me and go, forget it. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> I was uh, just going to ask. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to build a relationship with the engineer and, uh, you know, I have to be, there are times when I'll go to an engineer and just say, Hey, your car is fantastic. Leave it alone. I need to fix the driver. You, you, and, and if I've done that enough in an honest way, not making it up, but in an honest way, the engineer trusts me. Right. And then when I say, understand, like, look at the driver right now, he's just, he's lacking confidence. And the most engineers in that situation and, and the best engineers for sure get that. I mean, the best engineers know that no matter what the computer says, there's a human being behind the wheel and they will do that. And sometimes we will change the setup on the car, give the driver confidence and then work it back towards that faster, more le or less forgiving setup. And so we'll, we'll do that. Um, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the things that you do as a coach is you ask a lot of questions and you know, if, if I can ask a driver, okay, what's the car doing? If there was just one thing that the car could do better, that would help you, what would that be? And if the driver says something like, whatever, um, you know, the car understeers in the middle of the corner, in the middle of slow speed corners. Um, because uh, I've had drivers say it understeers. I'll go, okay, where? Uh, turn five. Where in turn five? In the middle of the corner. Uh, and then the next question is, what are you doing when it understeers? Are you on the brakes? Are you coming off the brakes? Are you completely off the brakes? Are you in that phase between brake and throttle? Are you starting to apply the throttle? Are you flat to the throttle? Are you initially turning the wheel in? Are you at full steering lock? Are you starting to unwind the steering wheel? And if we can kind of work through that, that process, if the driver says the understeer is right in the middle of the corner and I'm kind of, I'm trying to get on throttle, but I'm having to put a little bit more steering angle in, ah, what happens when you put more steering angle in with a car that has understeer? You're asking tires that have gone beyond the limit to do even more. Ah, yeah. that's not going to work. Actually, why don't you try this? Go back to this next session. And I want you, when you get the understeer, I want you to kind of actually just straighten the wheel, just like a degree or two on the steering wheel, just a tiny little bit. Just bring the tires back and let them gain some grip again. And let's work on that part of it. So, you know, a, a big part of coaching is, I, I call it peeling back the layers of the onion. And, you know, the initial thing is you got to understeer. Okay, we can ask the engineer to make a change of the car or you can fix it with your driving. And the driver's going, yeah, but I don't know how to, I don't know how to fix it. So let's get the engineer to fix it, you know. Okay, let's peel back the layers of the onion. And when we peel back the layers of the onion, we found out that actually what's maybe causing the problem is the driver actually putting more steering lock in when the tires are already beyond their limit. So by asking enough questions, peeling back the layers of the onion, we really find what the real issue is. And that's you know, that's the role of a coach is to is to peel onions. And, you know, as you're speaking about all this, I, I'm kind of thinking like, man, you know, it's it's sort of intimidating to have a driving coach, right? To have your your driving scrutinized at, at that level, um, which is the, the the whole intention of having a coach. But, you know, what, what do you say to people that, you know, might might want to explore a driving coach that would definitely accelerate their their uh, driving performance, but is, is feeling a little intimidated about approaching someone to scrutinize their driving? Well, I think first off, if you're not willing to have somebody help you, then accept that you're at a level that you're not going to improve as much as you could. 
I'll, I'll often have somebody ask me, you know, what should I do to be a better driver, have a better team, whatever, get better results, and and uh, trying not to be biased, anyways. But a coach will usually a good coach, the right coach, and by the way, the right coach may you know may not be somebody like getting the right coach that works with you is as important as how good they are. I would rather have a lesser coach that's a good fit than a great coach that doesn't fit with somebody. So there's that. But, um, you know, part of the, the, the job of the coach is also to develop that relationship with the driver. And uh, if, if somebody's feeling intimidated, then that's kind of the very first step of the as a coach i have worked with drivers where i could tell that they were there was sort of a little bit of a barrier there and sometimes it's sometimes it's ego sometimes the ego is getting in the way and sometimes it's you know just that whole um you know i know what i'm doing <laughs> leave me alone i know what i'm doing uh <laughs> So, you know, there's there's some of that and a good coach, a good coach that's the right fit will find a way to sort of slowly break that down and get more buy in from the driver. And now I have had drivers who, uh, you know, they say they're bought into it. And yet, like every single time you make a suggestion or ask a question, it's it's a defensive res, uh, response. And there are drivers who cannot be coached. Um, in, in fact, one of the very, very first and most important questions that a coach should use, needs to learn to use is, do you mind if I coach you? And, 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 you know, it's kind of like, how much, like, how much are you willing to let me coach you? And as soon as somebody says, well, yeah, you can coach me. Okay. How much, uh, whatever you take. Okay. Okay. You, you, you're really bought into that. Right. So the objective now is the objective is learning and yes, there are going to be things are going to point out that you're doing that is maybe less than ideal. Uh, but, uh, well, there, there's another part of this, I guess, is, is my part of my philosophy with coaching is, uh, I, I believe that it's part of my job to give as much confirming or more confirming feedback. Some people call it positive feedback, but it's really, it's confirming. Um, uh, I like to give like confirming, confirming feedback, more confirming feedback, so the, the, the driver's going, okay, and, and I say, you're doing that right. When you get that understeer, I can see the steering angle from the data that you're actually straight, straightening the wheel a little bit. You're doing a really nice job of managing the understeer, okay? Well, guess what that driver's gonna do more of now? That, because when you are rewarded, it's like giving your dog a treat. When you're rewarded with some confirming feedback, you're gonna do more of that whatever that was. And, you know, part of my job as a coach is to uh, give confirming feedback and strengthen somebody's strengths. And, and there are times where it's like, if, if I get you to do more of what you're doing well, you don't have time to do what you're not doing well. And right. sometimes the way to fix a problem is to do more of everything around it that you're doing well and that that problem kind of goes away so it, it's it's a you know it's a little bit of a subtlety of coaching but the best coaches do that kind of thing and, and and by the way sometimes a really 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 good coach is a friend or family member or somebody like that that just asks the question you know Hey, watching you, you break earlier than the other cars right there. Why? 
Now, if they're like, man, you break early, you're a wimp. That's not really helpful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if that person just says, hey, I'm just an observation is I noticed that you're breaking here. I can see some other cars that are breaking there. And that just it builds some awareness for you. And you're going, oh, huh, they can break there. What if I can? So, again, part of being a coach is to build awareness of what you're doing now and then help you compare that to what you want to be doing. And yeah, the best coaches do that as a kind of as a matter of fact, that's part of what they do. But sometimes, uh, you know, a friendly uh, comment by somebody else makes you kind of go, oh, okay, there's something there. I got to I got to work on that. So, yeah, no, that's I have a lot of friends like that. And then they say it in both ways. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So but now now let's let's move from sort of your philosophy, which I love, to, to some of the high performance driving techniques and tips that, that maybe we can give some of the listeners. You know, what are some common mistakes that you see with drivers at the track when they're starting out that, you know, we could easily fix or, or tune out when they're trying to, you know, get faster in their lap times? The I guess the first thing that comes to mind in is kind of the most obvious is drivers who try to drive too fast before they've developed the basic skills. Right. And, you know, it, it's like we were, hey, we were all born naturally knowing how to drive fast, right? That's part of our DNA. Actually, I'm not sure our DNA was developed when cars were even around. So, <laughs> uh, uh, but but I think, you know, that's that's the single biggest mistake is somebody trying to drive faster than their skills will allow them to do. So there are times where you kind of need to slow down a little bit, work on the basic skills. And, you know, when I say basic, some people go, yeah, but that's for, you know, that's for people that don't know anything. And again, I was born knowing how to drive and <laughs> look what I drive. You know, obviously I know how to drive fast. Uh, no, the basics, again, Lewis Hamilton works on the basics. That's what, it's not, it's not a, you know, that's not a kindergarten skill. It's the foundation. Maybe that's a better way, a better word. It's, you know, you need to keep working on the foundation. You, you know, you can't add a, a story onto the, you know, like another level onto your house without working on the foundation, strengthening the foundation. So, you know, that that's the very first thing I think is just people that try to drive too fast too soon without working on the skills. The, the you know the uh, the other thing that comes to mind are our habits. You know, a lot of drivers uh, they spend a lot of time on the track um, trying to fix bad habits. And where do those bad habits come from? From driving on the street. You know, unlike tennis, you know when a tennis pro walks off the tennis court, they don't play tennis on the way to their to the airport. But we come off a racetrack and then we drive our cars to work to the, to right. you know our families to our to on vacation to the airport to whatever, right? Um, and you know fortunately because we can't practice as often as a tennis player can. So we need to practice the basics, the skills, the foundation. We need to practice those things while driving on the street. And you don't need to drive fast, despite your no speed limit sign in the background there. <laughs> you, you know, we can drive at the speed limit and be working on the brake application, the brake release, where we're looking, how we use the throttle, how we use uh, the steering wheel. Uh, you, you know, we can work on those things at street speeds. And the, the number of times I've been in the passenger seat as an instructor and I look over and go, uh, you're worried about the transmission falling out of your car? Mm, why are you holding on to the shifter and driving with one hand? Why? Because that's the way they drive on the street. So drive with two hands on the steering wheel. If, if your brain has to use a tenth of a percent of its abilities to take your hand off the shifter and put it on the steering, steering wheel, when you're driving on the street or on the track now, that's a tenth of a percent that could be used in a better way. So start developing the best habits 
while driving on the on the on the street and you know when we brake on the street we tend to brake lightly and then a little harder and a little harder and a little harder and then the hardest part typically just before we come to a stop and most i'm going to say pretty i'm pretty sure that everybody listening to this podcast are sensitive to that last little bit where you don't get the car kind of doing that little jerk at the very very end yeah. so they're smooth there but when we're on the track we have to brake hard initial application now it can be smooth but it's got to be hard and quick and smooth and but it's going to be that and then gradually bleed off the brake or the ease off the brake pressure and that's a skill again we can practice on the street but i'm going to say for drivers who are relatively new to driving on the track it's one of the very first things that needs to get fixed because they tend to brake too lightly and then as they get close to the corner they're uh, they're braking harder 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 and their hair is starting to light on fire at that point in time now they've got the car standing up on his nose they're turning into the corner the car feels unsettled and it is so they think well i gotta brake earlier well actually you just need to brake you need to get i was and this is like a really sort of such a generalized kind of it's a concept um it's a conceptual thing i say do two-thirds of your braking in the first third of the brake zone so if your brake zone is a hundred feet long then you need to get most of your braking done in the first 33 feet then you know that's where the heavy braking get, gets done then as you get closer to the end i'm not saying that you come off the brake pedal at that point but you can start to kind of ease off the pedal as the car gets slower and then in the last little bit just before you turn into the corner you're starting to you're making a decision of do i stay on the brakes a little bit to keep taking some speed off like you're adjusting your corner entry speed uh, so you're you're making that last final little decision right then to do I stay on the brakes or do I ease off the brakes? Have I overslowed? Have I underslowed here? What do I need to do? So I'm fine tuning my corner entry speed, but I'm also thinking about what do I want the car? What kind of an attitude do I want in the car? Do I want sort of the front end loaded as I turn in? Do I want to be off the brakes and keeping the sort of the car more balanced? equally the weight equally distributed over all four tires so you're you're doing the fine tuning of the load transfer the balance of your car in that last little bit just around the turning point if you haven't got enough of your braking done early in the brake zone you can't do that at that point you're in crisis management mode <laughs> as opposed to fine tuning mode so i'd say that's that's a huge thing uh you know obviously vision it's one of the things that gets stressed over and over and over again of look farther ahead and yeah for sure look farther ahead again we drive on the street we typically nowadays pretty much always it seems we're driving in traffic and as humans our eyes are attracted to bright shiny objects like the tail lights of the car just in front of us so we drive around a lot looking at the tail lights of the car just in front of us and that becomes our habit so when we get on the track, even if there's no car in front of us, that's about where we still look. So it's um, we need to we need reminders, constant reminders or triggers of eyes up, look ahead, eyes up, look ahead, eyes up, look ahead, and practicing that, and then keeping our eyes moving, scanning, looking around, being aware of our peripheral vision, you know, being able to. Uh, notice things off the side or in your mirrors all that kind of stuff so um, the whole vision process is <clears throat> it is way more complex and yet in some ways it's pretty simple if you start with looking further ahead and sort of keeping your vision your eyes moving scanning moving around if you do those two things you're 95 percent of the way there Okay. Um, and and so you're you you've described sort of the foundation, right? And and now I've done all these things and now I'm getting faster on the track and I'm doing the right things and I'm starting to hit what high speed really means. And now we hit a different barrier. We hit the fear and anxiety of going triple digit speeds when we're not used to it. You know, what what are some what are some things that you coach 
to maybe some amateur drivers that you know might might be scared to hold flat out where they sh- you know should be holding flat out or you know going 130 on the on the roval at auto club you know what 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 uh you know what's your approach to that breathe okay <laughs> the very first thing is uh actually and again this is a uh, uh, it, it's part of our mental programming. It's a part of our habits, and it's it's really easy to, you know, our natural uh, uh, response to fear a lot of times is <gasps> hold our breath, and when we do that, we tense our body up, and when we tense our body up, we're actually getting less feedback through the car. So right when we need it most to sense what the car is doing, we mess ourselves up by holding our breath and tensing up. So one of the things I would do with a driver that in that situation is I'd actually have them mentally practice. Come into a corner and now see yourself coming into the corner five miles an hour faster than you've ever come into that corner. But as you do that, exhale, nice slow breath. Now do that 50 times. Close your eyes, do that 50 times. And now you're starting to build that a habit or a mental program. And by the way, when you're driving on the street, every single time you enter an off ramp, relax, breathe, exhale. So you're building this habit so that when you're in a self or a self preservation situation, a, a stressful situation, your natural instinct or your habit is ah, relax, breathe. So that's part of the process. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things, one of the approaches I use is as you start to go faster and you're approaching corners at a higher speed, or you should be starting to, to enter the corner at a higher speed, uh, I won't say break later. I'll say break exactly where you are now. I just want you to break just like a couple of percent lighter, just a tiny bit lighter. And think about it. When you break lighter, the car is actually better balanced. When a car is better balanced, not standing up on his nose, it actually has more grip when it's balanced. So by braking lighter, you're going to have more grip. So now that's a more relaxing thought than, okay, time to, you know what, yeah. run it in there, break at the very last moment, stand the car up on his nose, turn in, have the car be all unsettled, and scare the heck out of yourself. That's not a good approach. So start with a relaxed approach and often a very uh, slightly lighter break is is the right approach. And okay. and then, you know, just again, building that habit of being calm and relaxed when things are like that. Because we're trying to get to the point where you're comfortable being uncomfortable. That's, that's a mode that... Uh, you need to get to the point where sometimes it's it, you're so comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's that's what you that's what you crave. And you know, take that to an extreme, and you see some of these extreme athletes. Uh, you know, Travis Pastrana jumps out of an airplane with no parachute. <laughs> wow, you know, yeah. well, he's comfortable at that kind of uncomfortableness, right? Yeah. Most of us are not, uh, but it's part of his programming, his habits. So. Yeah, and maybe okay. something missing from his brain. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. uh, Travis is an awesome guy, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes I wonder, yeah. dude. Yeah, I mean, jumping on a plane without a parachute. I mean, who? who how do you even get into that? Yeah. But yeah. okay, so now now let's uh, you know let let's move on to car control, right? I mean, you, once you've sort of developed some of these good habits and developed speed, um, now you're you're looking at driving at the limit and kind of being on the edge of the car, and you might lose some control a little bit and. You're going to want to regain that. What are some things that you know we can do as drivers to sort of accelerate our car control and accelerate getting better at it? First off, if it's raining, go on track. Okay. A lot of drivers will go, oh, it's raining. I'm going to skip this session. No. I just had a snow day, by the way, at, at oh, the fa- Big Willow. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so so um, don't avoid bad conditions. Okay. You know, if it's raining, go there. Um, so that, that's the very first thing. Uh, the second thing is sometimes it's good to practice on really old tires. Like 
the more the car moves around, the more you get used to the car moving around. Right. And, you know, so a lot of, I mean, I'm not going to say a lot. Many, some drivers are too quick to put on the latest and greatest sticky tires mm-hmm. when they would actually learn more with the oldest and ugliest of tires. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so there's some value in I mean, a big part of car control is getting used to the car moving around. And if you're not used to the car moving around, you're just never going to be, again, you're not going to get comfortable being uncomfortable with the car moving around. Right. Um, so, so that's, that's, that's a very, you know, kind of some basic stuff. Uh, anytime that you can do any kind of uh, skid control training, like a skid pad thing, that's a great experience. Uh, if, um, uh, you know, go to a rally school, go drive on dirt and gravel and mud. Um, that's good experience. Again, you're getting used to the car moving around. The good thing about skid pads and rally schools is the speeds are slower and you tend to be like on a road course, we can be going through a corner and kind of go, whoa, whoa, whoa. And like in a second and a half, we've experienced oversteer. Whereas in the gravel or on a skid pad, it's like, oh, we're an oversteer, we're an oversteer, we're an oversteer, we're an oversteer. Okay, okay, I got it, I'm getting it, yeah. Uh, we could spend five, 10, 15, 20 seconds or more in oversteer. So we have more time to practice managing it, working with it. So that's the advantage of, of any kind of a, a low grip surface training. Um, right. You know, there's some guys around that do some really, really awesome, um, you know, skid training courses and things like that. Those are a fantastic kind of way to go. Um, you know, you can do at a track, you can do what <laughs> I just uh, did this past week with my my driver that races an IMSA in a LMP2 car, a prototype sports car, okay. where we took, we had, you know, we he'd run on a set of tires to the point where they were pretty much done. We put new tires on, had him just do a basically a, a scrub in like five, 10 minutes on them. And then what we did was we came back in and we took the rear tires from the old worn out set and put them on the car, keeping the good new tires on the front and had him go and run a bunch of laps with a car that was really unbalanced and really difficult to drive. And, but he, you know, the, with more time, I mean, you just see his movement of the steering wheel and his hands on the wheel is quick, but controlled. And, you know, he's catching slides that, you know, he, at some time ago, he would not have caught. And then we did the opposite, where then we put the good rear tires on and put the bad, worn out front tires on and had him go and work with understeer and how you manage understeer that way. So don't be afraid to experiment. Somebody said, a friend of mine said this to me the other day. He says, you learn more by experimenting than you do through experience. And I thought, that's a really good way of putting it. Like, I think it's a, you know, it's certainly something in the way I approach my coaching is experimenting. And it's something that I think too many drivers are too afraid to do. They're afraid to experiment with things. You know, they're afraid to go and like, well, it's a practice session. I'm not going to go out there and worn out tires. Why not? Yeah. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? You're going to learn something. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not going to be able to turn my fastest lap time. Okay. When is it most important that you learn your, your turn your fastest lap time? Well, qualifying tomorrow. Well, how about up until then, we're in experimenting and learning mode. So uh, uh, I'm gonna say those are the, those are some things that you can do, you know, rain, low grip uh, training, um, you know, worn out tires, different tires, you know, the, those kinds of things. Work with somebody who does some skid control training that kind of stuff that will make a big difference that's uh i I really like that uh you know experimentation is better than experience because you're right experience you're it you are waiting for opportunities experimentation you're creating them yourself so that's and there's go for it yeah there there, there's there's i i I don't there's a saying i can't remember what it is exactly but it's kind of like you could have the experience of doing the exact same thing. You could have 10 years of experience of doing the exact same thing. 
Yeah. Is that better than having one year of experimenting and having a lot of different experiences? Yeah. Uh, no, that's a really good point. I mean, I'm, I'm like uh, this like tire trick that you just described. I'm absolutely going to use that. That is, that is, that's a great way to go. That's, uh, yeah. I don't, I, I almost feel like, why didn't I think of that? But you know, it's so simple. Like you said, it's complex, but it's not, you know, right. it's very easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think we're at the end of our episode, Ross. And honestly, like it's, it's amazing how much you can teach. It's amazing how much I've learned just in this hour and change that we've spent talking here. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your knowledge. I think it's been uh, it's it's been eye opening for me, so I'm sure it's been eye opening for a lot of our listeners. Uh, but you know, if if we have someone that's interested in in, in learning more, right? How can they reach you? Uh, speedsecrets.com. You know okay. my yeah, just my website, and it leads off to everything else. And I have a ton of uh, sort of free content on there. Uh, every week, I I answer a question. Um, I have a little page on there that's Ask Ross, and I get people sending me uh, messages or whatever with a question, and I put an answer there. So there's tons of free stuff on there, and yeah, some stuff that I charge for. And but <laughs> SpeedSecrets.com. All right, yep. yeah, and I would encourage every single one of you buy the books, but even all the free content, the podcasts, uh, the the Ask Ross questions following you on Instagram. I mean, there's all you provide so so much knowledge and you know, I think uh I think I can speak on behalf of of all drivers or all people trying to undertake this that they're very thankful that there are people like you who are willing to share that that knowledge and those tidbits to to help us improve our driving. So thank you so much. Thank you for being on the episode. Uh if you want to find us or please follow us at 91 Octane. That's all letters, no numbers. Also, please, please, please like and subscribe wherever you're listening. If you want to send us any emails, info at 91octane.com. And I think that's any last words, Ross. Hey, have fun. Uh, yeah, right. Keep learning, keep learning and have fun. Keep learning and have fun. That's ultimately it. All right. Good night. <laughs>